Some people are hung up on some flubs President Biden had last night, but Donald Trump himself had an entire week of crazy, including the completely bonkers rally in Doral. Where do things stand at the end of this week? Well, let, let's just say one thing very clearly. I, I am really want to emphasize that the Democratic Party is very united right now. They are very united around an important principle, and that is beating Donald Trump. There's some honest disagreement right now about the best way to do that. But everyone understands that is the goal that unites us. And frankly, this week is a good example of, of showing why that is so important. I mean, it's crazy town over there, whether it's electric boats or whether it's, you know, showers or toilets or all the nonsense he talks about and his revenge and his lack of respect for the Constitution. We can go on and on about what a jerk this guy is. So I, I really think everybody just needs to take a deep breath respectfully people can disagree about the best way to beat donald trump and i will make a prediction stephanie at the close of the democratic convention you will see an incredible unity around whoever is leading the ticket at that mo moment and that decision will be made by one person and one person alone joe biden that's a really interesting way to put it. P potentially what the democratic party is doing right now is ensuring that they have the best possible SWAT team to, to defend themselves, to defeat the biggest threat to democracy, Donald Trump. Where do you think things stand, Hayes? I think that Claire is right that the party is united around this goal, but I think that the divisions over who is at the top of the ticket are deep and they're getting deeper. I think that there's been, I think that what's been interesting since the debate, which again, the Biden team wanted to hold it early, precisely kind of for this reason, so that in case there was a, a situation where Biden underperformed, let's say, uh, they would have time to make up the difference as opposed to it happening just a couple of weeks for people to hold, uh, go to the polls. But I think that there was a moment with the debate where a lot of people who had told themselves, all right, look, the Biden is the candidate. This is how it's going to be. Uh, he's, yes, he's very old, but he's still very capable. We're going to keep our mouth shut and just get through this till the election. I think that the debate really sh sort of shattered that illusion for a lot of people. And so the debate over how to beat Donald Trump is going to be front and center between now and the end of the convention. And it's why you have people looking at alternatives, why you have the Biden campaign polling on how well uh, Kamala Harris does in a head, head with Trump instead of Biden. It's why you see this sort of division disarray that's happening right now. I, I, I think that uh, Claire is right, that by the time we end the convention, everything will be set in stone at that point. There will, we are in this sort of interregnum it period. Damn well better be. <laughs> people are trying to figure out, we're trying, people are trying to figure out what can happen, what levers can be pulled between now and the end of the DNC. But after that, ballots are going to be starting to be printed. Early voting is only like, several weeks after that and people are going to have to be on board by that point if beating trump really is the goal jamal what do you think where are things in this race so uh, let me just say i just think it is a startling amount of spinelessness in the democratic party i said this on social media but i'll clean it up for this show if Donald Trump would have urinated on himself on that stage, the Republicans would have called it the greatest presidential urination they've ever seen. And I am stunned at the level of discord that's in this party right now, because at the end of the day, this was a story that could have lasted a couple of days. And the Democrats, by various uh, elected officials coming out and saying that they want to see a replacement uh, with George Clooney's editorial, with all of this, you've extended the lifespan of what essentially I think would have been a non-story 30 days later. And now you've extended it, given it life, given it credibility, because the, the reality is that Joe Biden has done more than enough, not for his own party to turn over. Certainly, I don't think that's everybody in the party, but allowing what should be an in-house conversation to get this public was completely egregious. And I hate to say it, but what the politicians are saying, what the donors are saying, does not match what the people are saying. Most of the people, I think, practically know, yes, Joe Biden is old. We've been knew that, okay? We knew that three years ago. 
We knew what age he was going to be already. And I think right now all they're doing is continually sapping the energy from the voters who want to see Donald Trump defeated by continuing a story that frankly should never have been given this much life in the first place. Claire, what do you think about Jamel's thoughts? Well, listen, I, you know, I got to tell you, the difference between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, there are many differences. And Jamel and I would agree about those differences in terms of our values and how we see a way forward in this country and uh, things about opportunity and equality and all kinds of issues, economic issues. But one difference is our party has a tendency to, you know, to fight in public. We don't gaslight the country and try to pretend that Donald Trump isn't a felon and that Donald Trump hasn't been found uh, to be uh, responsible for sexual assault on a woman and fined hundreds of millions of dollars for cheating on everything from charities to his taxes. Uh, and we don't gaslight the country. The country saw something they were concerned about in the debate. And the majority of the country still expresses concern about the aging process. That's a fact. The fact that Democrats are talking about it openly, I got to tell you, in some ways, I think it's healthy because the issue is baked in. And now Biden has an opportunity to show the country he can do this. I thought he did a great job in the press conference last night. And ultimately, he can heal all these wounds by how he handles this. Um, if he's the nominee coming out of the convention, he will heal it by uniting us and saying everything is now about defeating Donald Trump. If he were to decide to step aside, he can heal it by saying, hey, I get it. I said I would hand a torch and I'm handing it to the, uh, uh, an incredibly capable vice president. So I'm not as worried about this as everyone else is, because I do think we will come together like Democrats usually do in order to defeat a guy that is the most danger to our country that we've seen probably in my lifetime. Joyce, it's a huge understatement to say these two parties are different. We thought that last night our reporting was going to be about Donald Trump's sentencing in the hush money case, because it was all supposed to be yesterday, but now that's been pushed to September 18th. Instead, it was the current president trying to prove himself to doubters in his own party, a, a stunning turn. What do you think about where we are right now? You know, to the point that Claire is making, Democrats are the party of the big tent. And something that I think presents the contrast between the two parties is the fact that we are seeing this debate. Democrats don't enforce a dogma upon people that belong to the party. You don't get expelled from the party like Liz Cheney was expelled from the Republicans because you don't have a total agreement on the leadership of the party. We don't have a cult of personality, a Donald Trump in the Democratic Party. We do have people like me, I'll be clear about my bias, who honor Joe Biden's service and believe his experience is something that we should not set aside just because he's getting a little bit older. I mean, that's a cultural issue that we have in America where we go after the bright, shiny thing and sometimes don't value people as they age. But I think his experience is important. Other Democrats see other things in other candidates that they like. And we are free to have those conversations, even when they're public and they're very messy. I think that makes us strong particularly in contrast to a Republican Party where what we see is dogma and worship of a leader who the New York Times and the L.A. Times both came out today and called completely unfit to lead the country. That's the stark difference between these two parties, one that values democracy and the other that doesn't. Claire, what's your take on this new reporting that there are donors who have paused $90 million in donations? Paused, not pulled. I want to understand how big of a deal you think this is, what it could mean for down-ballot races. Oh, I think it probably helps Joe Biden. Um, frankly, he's going to have an outpouring of grassroots financial support because of it. Um, I think the, the very, very wealthy people think they're way more important than they actually are in politics today because there has been, uh, there's a lot of horrible things about the internet as it relates to politics. 
You know, we don't mm -hmm. have fact checking, misinformation flourishes, but it has allowed real money to flow to candidates from folks in the amount of $10, $20, $30. I'm not worried about Joe Biden having enough money and frankly, the billionaires wanting to cut him off. Um, I think that probably helps his narrative. So I don't think that's a big problem for him. I think the bigger problem is the pressure he's under to perform and how he handles that in the coming weeks before the convention and then um, how, how he handles the decision he has to make at that point in time. And by the way, you know, the other weird thing about this is in an age where none of us trust polling, it's turned out that maybe the polling in the next month may determine the course of this country. And that is a very scary thing as far as I'm concerned. Give me those low donors online. And frankly, I don't like anybody relying on polling at this juncture. On the one level, this is just Trump's MO. The second he's confronted with something or someone that he thinks makes him look bad, his immediate response is to pretend that he's never heard of or met this person in their lives. Despite the fact that literally Dozens of people who worked for him worked on this giant policy document that's uh, been put out by the Heritage Foundation. I, I think that uh, the fact that he is dissing himself, he knows that it is unpopular. I don't think he probably knows the specifics of what's in it. I doubt that he has seen the exact polling on it. But I think that it speaks to the fact that, uh, like Republican policies for decades at this point, when voters learn what they actually are, they're deeply unpopular. Many of the pieces inside Project 2025, which as a whole seeks to dismantle the federal government as we know it, it's, a, it's the anti-deep state playbook filled with all sorts of other wild conservative wish list items that have been swirling around the GOP for a long time now. But the fact that they're all put into one place conveniently for us to be able to look at and to show to voters and be like, here's what they want to do. Here's their blueprint for what they want whoever the next GOP president is to do. That's become deeply uh, problematic for the GOP. They can't really stand behind their own policies. And so that's why you see Trump sort of trying to push it away. Like it, it's one of the nice things about being a cult of personality. The policies don't matter as much as the person. So if the person can get away with saying, you know what, I just focus on me, look at me, look at my face, don't read the thing, just look at me. And if that can work, he's going to go for it. Joyce, you have spent a lot of time on Project 2025 over the last few weeks and months trying to educate and inform people of what's really in this thing. What do you think is the most dangerous component? That's a tough question, Steph. You know, I've been writing about this since last November when we first learned of its existence. It's nothing new, by the way. Heritage has put this together for different administrations. Trump had a playbook in 2016. Ronald Reagan had a playbook. But this one is unique because it promotes this very new notion. It used to be a fringe Republican idea of a unitary, powerful executive that really overwhelms the other two branches of government, supposedly co-equal, perhaps with some complicity from the Supreme Court to allow the president to straight line towards these hardcore sorts of Republican goals. You mentioned one, getting rid of the Department of Education, which doesn't really seem like a great idea to people who, for instance, believe that Head Start or funding for special education is a, a good idea. So the real problem with Project 25, 2025 is that it's 900 plus pages. And I think the folks at the Heritage Foundation and others count on the fact that very few people will sit down and study 900 plus pages of policy written in the very banal tones of policymakers. But when you look at each chapter, chapters are written by different people with expertise, over 80 percent of them people who were involved in Trump's administration. They advocate for radical policy changes that will diminish the rights that Americans now enjoy, calls for a total ban, for instance, on abortion, making the interstate shipment of mifepristone, the abortion drug used by over half of American women who get abortions, making that illegal. So the important takeaway here is that this is Trump's plan. And to Hayes' point about Trump's efforts to 
sort of distance himself from the plan. The Biden campaign this afternoon posted video on Twitter of the Heritage Foundation's president saying it's OK that Trump is trying to distance himself from this plan. We know he needs to do that to get elected. In essence, he's saying it is OK for Trump to lie about this and acknowledging that it is not just Heritage's plan. It is Trump's, too. We know what's coming okay. if Trump is reelected. Now it's up to us as voters to reject it. And this is the big head scratcher to me then, Claire. If this manifesto is so unpopular, if it is so off-putting, why on earth would they have published it to begin with? Why not keep it in their back pocket? Uh, Donald Trump wins, and after he does, whip it out and say, all right, I'm about to drop the hammer with it. This seems like a massive self-inflicted wound. Yeah, well, remember, there's two kinds of officials that served in the Trump administration last time. The first kind are all those that are refusing to endorse him and say he shouldn't be reelected. And the second kind decamped to the Heritage Foundation to write a plan so that he could get done next time what they failed to do last time. He had some guardrails last time. He had some members of his cabinet, some members mm -hmm. of his staff that pushed back and said, you can't do that. You can't call the military out on protesters. You can't just shoot people at the border. You can't do that. And this time, they don't want to have that problem. They want to make sure they have the people ready to staff the government that will do exactly what's in Project 2025. They want to make sure they have the plans down. And frankly, they're banking on the fact that it is dense and long, and that's not how people consume information, especially the voters that Trump is worried about right now. Remember, Biden and Trump aren't going for the heart of the Republican Party or the heart of the Democratic Party right now. Those are set in stone. They're going for the margins. That's how this next president is going to get elected, on the margins. So we can talk about disarray in the Democratic Party, and we can talk about the crazy MAGA cult, but really, it's folks that really are not happy with their choices, that don't call themselves either party, that will decide this election in three places, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Jamal, do you think people have really paid attention to the consequences of a second Trump presidency? No, I don't. I think they're thinking that people are being alarmist, but they just need to refer to 2016. And I would ask all those people, particularly the ones who just couldn't bring themselves to vote for Hillary Clinton, the but her emails people, but the I don't trust her, but she's not likable people. Knowing what you know today, given the fact that the Supreme Court is now um, very much Donald Trump's Supreme Court. Would you have traded you standing on ceremony, you trying to prove a point for what we see today? And I have a feeling a lot of those people would. The crime of it is that a lot of those same people are signing up to make the same mistake all over again. And I agree with Claire. See, last time you had a couple people that might talk a little bit of sense into him and not might make sure that the very worst thoughts in his mind wouldn't actually come to fruition, you will not have that this time around. So it's going to go right from this scary place, which is his brain, to his mouth, right into policy. And I think people need to understand that. You asked the question, Stephanie, at the beginning of this about why would the Republicans allow this to be known about Project 2025 now when we're this close to the election and they're exposing their playbook? My question is, why haven't the Democrats been hammering this from the beginning? Because Y'all just touched on the, the smaller parts of this. There's a ton of stuff in here that those fringe groups that Claire was discussing would be very interested to know. Like, I'm sure members of the military would love to know that there's this plan in Project 2025 to completely gut military health care and especially military retirement benefits. You think they might want to know that? I think they would. And sometimes what happens in politics is that People begin to talk so far above the heads of the people who are actually voting. You got to make it plain and you got to make it simple. Simple thing is, yes, national ban on abortion. Another simple thing is that already we see what how DEI is being wiped out. It'll be non-existent to those black voters who do not understand all of the things that are in this and how it would directly impact them. One of them is coming after the civil servants. Black people make up a huge amount of the civil servant workforce. This is something that will directly, uh, uh, that will directly impact you. So shout out to Taraji B. Henson, the actor, because at the BET Awards, she talked about 
Project 2025. And you should see what the search engine did because she did it at an entertainment award show where the audience that it needs to reach needs to hear about what's in that. So my question again is, yeah, the Republicans made a mistake by letting this be known. Why haven't the Democrats made them pay for it? Hey there, MSNBC fans. I'm Luke Russert, and be sure to join me, Rachel Maddow, Jen Psaki, Lawrence O'Donnell, Steve Kornacki, Joy Reid, and many more, September 7th in Brooklyn, MSNBC Live Democracy 2024. Click on the link for ticket information. We will see you there.